Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in the Alma 2020 webinar series. My name is Thad Gurley, and I will be moderating today's discussion on laboratory resource planning and modeling using time-driven activity-based costing. We like to our webinars to be interactive, so we urge you to take we urge you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. In keeping with this, in keeping this webinar interactive, our speaker will address the questions throughout and at the end of the webinar. Please use the question box on your GoToWebinar browser to submit questions. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, but if you run out of time during the question answer session, I will forward any unanswered questions to the presenter. Additional resources for the webinar are located on the right side of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Alma website shortly following the webinar. I would especially like to thank our sponsors, Pace Analytical and ASTM International, for sponsoring our second webinar. Without their sponsorship, we would be unable to provide the webinars to our Alma community free of charge. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Jonathan Walston. Jonathan is currently completing his doctorate in technology management with a concentration in quality systems through the Indiana State University Consortium program. Jonathan holds, holds an MS in chemistry, a graduate business certificate, and a BS in chemistry with a minor in mathematics from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. In his current role with Thermo Fisher Scientific, he works in the Pharmaceutical Development Series Services Organization in the Analytical Development Group in Greenville, North Carolina, as a manager supporting laboratory services functions. This role includes supporting data review, metrology, sample management, training, and scheduling. In his spare time, Jonathan is also the co-owner of a small consulting company. Prior to his current role, Jonathan worked in operational excellence with Thermo Fisher Scientific on a variety of side projects. Jonathan has also worked in sterile manufacturing and with a variety of instrumental analyses. Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you. I appreciate everybody's time. Um, so this is a great topic today, and thank you, thank you everybody for attending. I heard I've got quite a few people from all over the world, so this is exciting. Uh, I did want to give um, a, a shout out to the program I'm in, Indiana State. I think if not for that program, I wouldn't have been able to collect as much information as I have about a variety of topics um, and my lab experience as well I think is it plays really heavily into this topic um, as well as my OPEX background so when I was in OPEX I was able to come in and learn about um, different processes that may be a little outside of the norm when it looks when you're looking at lab management uh, lab services um, currently I am with Thermo Fisher Scientific and in my role it has given me a lot of opportunities to collect uh, and utilize different tools um, that I'm able to use as well and like I said my side like Thad said my side gig of the life science consulting um, so getting right into the topic today laboratory resource planning and modeling with uh, time dri driven activity based costing um, it's a fancy topic, uh, fancy words for a topic that I hope to simplify today for everybody. So, first of all, I want to start off going back to because my background and what I'm learning is uh, in my doctorate is quality systems. I, I like to take systematic approaches and I like to think about systems. Um, so, what is a system? So, this slide really allows me to simplify uh, and give some examples. So, basically, you have an input and that input feeds into processes, um, then the significance of those processes is they produce outputs. Uh, and a healthy system would have a feedback loop that would tell the inputs uh, something from the outputs to keep things in harmony. An important part of this whole system is understanding the environment as well, and it's something that is typically overlooked when we're looking at systems. So I did want to bring that up and, and put that into this slide. Um, as far as defining system productivity, when we look at a system, we have outputs and inputs. Uh, to really look at productivity, though, we're looking at the ratio of the outputs over the inputs. So if you have an output that's greater than the input, uh, the productivity is over 100%. Uh, it's intuitive to understand that. And it's also not realistic in many perspectives to say you're going to get over 100% output. So if your output is much lower than the system or than the input, then you say your system productivity and your efficiency is, is not good. You're not actualizing the maximum efficiency and getting to that 100%. Okay. Excuse so, me, Jonathan. I think yep. that we're not seeing your screen clearly. Okay. So if you can um, 
share I guess share your screen of your speaking of your um, pro like your profile screen then everyone can see I'm sorry okay. that's okay let me see here so is, is no one able to see is everyone maximized in the camera mode or is there any issues there or? Yes, folks, you'll need to you'll need to make sure that you have a full screen because Jonathan is the way he's planning on um, showing this is using the screen as a background. Right. So if you maximize the view of me as with the camera, you should be able to see the slides. Um, so I'll give everybody a second to do that. Uh, and if that doesn't work, just continue to give me feedback and I'll switch to the, the PowerPoint. Okay. Hey, everybody. I, yeah, I'm getting chats. It's, I, on my end, the screen looks fine. So screen, yeah, er, the chats, I'm getting, everything's good to go. Perfect. Okay. All Great. right, I'll keep going. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. Yes, thanks, everybody. So, so when we're looking at the productivity, um, let me go back here. Yeah, so we're looking at the productivity, and we say if our inputs are greater than our outputs, or excuse me, if our output is greater than our input, we're saying we're overachieving. If our output is less than our input, we're saying we're not achieving full capacity. We're not achieving full productivity. Um, and the environment in the workplace is, uh, the situation is obviously, we're talking about the labs. So let me make sure here. Okay. So a resource planning system. What does a resource planning system look like? Um, we have demand. So demand is our input. And then we have some processes. It, it may differ based on the business. Uh, so instead of these inputs, you have the demand, it feeds into some processes, and then that goes into the output, which is capacity, right? So your capacity is your output, which in this case would be actual capacity achieved um, in your business, what you could do. So the feedback loop for that and how it exists is to say, what is your actual capacity that you need to understand to be able to adjust your demand? So that's what this system looks like, high level, and, and what I hope to speak about um, just as an example. So when we think about demand, what is demand? Um, it's very significant, obviously. And there's one way to think about demand it is your only system input uh, around resource planning. If your demand is not stable or it's inaccurate, your capacity is at risk because the revenue is in flux, right? So if you don't have a stable system, you don't have stable inputs. So the above calculation shows demand error and how that's calculated. Um, and this is used for demand planning. And I, I wanted everyone to understand this before we get into the next step. But the best practice is to show a healthy system is to understand stable demand that's in control um, to allow for capacity to be planned best. So the other example I put on the bottom here, the MAPE, is the maximum average percent error which allows you to understand the normality of the demand in the system as an input. So you wanna be able to understand this and track it over time. So the more data points you have, the more stable your system is, um, and, and it'll work itself out and you'll kind of get a stable curve that says, what is my demand? That accommodates for short fluctuations and those short fluctuations are important because uh, if you see one month where or a quarter that something drops or goes up and then you say is this real are we going to actually see this for a long term the more data points you have the more feedback you can have about that system um, so it's very important to have long-term and short-term views when you're looking at demand so what is capacity so capacity is dependent on demand obviously as an output um, just like your demand as an input uh, when you're looking at the maximum level of output that can be sustained, um, we're looking at capacity as basically what you can accomplish with your resources in your business. So additional inputs or demand that we try to put into capacity may be delayed if you cannot achieve 100% of what your expected capacity is. Uh, and it's important to understand that because if you want to get more out of the system with your demand than you can achieve, it's unrealistic. You can't achieve over achieve over 100%. I like to look at this from a chemistry standpoint as like your rate limiting reaction or your rate limiting um, step because you can't achieve higher than 100% output uh, based on capacity. Uh, and an also important note here is the productivity 
uh, is equal to resources and resources are equal to people because we're in the business of, of um, intellectual activities. So when you look at demand and capacity um, as a ratio, you get this percent demand of capacity, which we talked about earlier is a feedback loop. Uh, so here's a, a very simple example. We want to achieve 100%, obviously. Uh, with this, we would say we're under capacity, right? So you do 50 tests uh, out of 100. So 50 is your demand and 100 is your capacity. Um, you're only achieving half of what you could achieve with your resources, right? The same example here, we're saying we have a demand of 100 tests but we can only achieve 50. Therefore, we would say we're over capacity. Um, and this is where that feedback loop comes in and why I think it's important that everyone understands this aspect of, of the topic first. That's why I'm giving this foundational groundwork. Um, so when you look at resources and productivity, uh, so just like I said earlier, productivity equals resources and resources equal people. Um, when, you're, when you're planning, it means understanding capacity and being certain of your demand. So you really need to know that. You need to know what your demand is and it needs to be stable. You also need to understand fully your capacity and improved, improving demand means knowing what the true productivity is through knowing how to plan and utilize your resources effectively, uh, which leads us into uh, the next part of the topic. So resorting to resource request is resourceful but expensive so uh, i wanted to make some some wordy uh, puns here to get to the fact that you know these resources are expensive it costs a lot we want to make sure that we're allocating these resources uh, because they are a long-term drain for any organization and it's, it's a big investment to you know hire people and get them up uh, whether you need them for if you need them for short term it's it's a question of is that worth it? How do you how do you do these things? How do you plan? Um, that's where activity-based costing is is very useful. So understanding costing systems, because there are a variety of these different types of cost systems. In the next few slides, I'm going to do an overview of some cost accounting systems so you can understand how they compare with an activity-based uh, and time-driven activity-based cost accounting system versus what you may have seen from a traditional system um, and how these can be used effectively. Okay, so there's a lot on this slide, but I put the, the blue stars up there because that's what we're gonna start on. That's what everyone's gonna focus on and what I'm gonna be speaking to first. So the simplest model of financial overhead allocation is the variable model. And as you see here, this model takes product costs as variable costs and fixed costs as period costs. So this allows for a company to know what the fixed costs are. Um, these are expected, there's not a surprise, and you can plan these by year, uh, by cycle, and the variable costs are what's spent for materials and basically the cost of doing business to generate the product that's outside of what your expected fixed costs are. So really, because there's just two buckets, it's either one or the other. Uh, it's a very simple model, um, but that there's a beauty to that, but it also uh, is limiting. So with the variable model, um, you'll see here represented in a graph this allows you to see the how how this stuff all adds up so you look at the total variable costs and as they increase based on the volume uh, you see those total variable costs are increasing because those are the costs of doing business uh, based on units whereas your fixed costs uh, your resources that you just you know you have people staffing whatever it is those things are flat because this total cost and uh, the variable cost and the fixed cost is additive, you take your total sales costs and you subtract your total cost to get your net income. So this gray section at the top here just tells you this is where you know your, what you're making, your, your net income and what it is. The problem with the system is if your business is growing or shrinking, then how do your fixed costs get represented? Because they're a flat line across um, the business 
and this model doesn't really allow you to have those the, the, the capability to deal with those fluctuations um, and it's not very flexible so that's an important note to make so the next uh, model to look at is the absorption model so the, the blue stars up here um, if you look at this you can see it's more complicated uh, it uses product costs and as variable costs and fixed costs related to production so this is where you split off your production costs and then you have your non-production costs as as period costs so it's important to note that and usually there's cost centers involved uh, and when you look at this there's a, a measured activity uh, there's accountability to cost centers there's budgets that are developed and then you're able to basically calculate your product costs based on your unit of activity and your overhead activity rate. So this model gives you more flexibility because now you're kind of planning ahead by different business unit or whatever it is, cost center, and you're saying, okay, this is what we think you're gonna do and this is what you do, um, so this is what your budget is, right? And that's why this system is, is typically what uh, is used relatively heavily, absorption model. And as you can see with this model, though, uh, one of the downsides is it, it gets complicated because over time when you're tracking this, uh, the graphing and, and all the data representation, there's a lot of different ways to spin and pivot this, uh, which can make it difficult. So this is where getting into the traditional activity-based costs. So going forward, we're going to start talking about all activity-based now that you understand what the, the other aspects are and the foundational stuff. So when you look at activity-based costs, there's traditional and time-driven. Time-driven is going to be the focus today, but I did want to hit on the, the traditional because there's a lot of similarities there, a lot of overlap. So as you look at the allocation of all costs, they're located to products that, that are located to these things called cost drivers. The distinction between production and non-production costs is not important. So, uh, you know, typically you look at a system and you go, okay, is, is this production or, or is this non-production? Um, and you split these things out as like support or directly related to some product. This takes away those distinctions. It all comes into one bucket. Those accumulated costs go into pools based on business processes. So this is why when you, you hear activity-based, we're looking at activities based on the process. It also allows for you to measure the drivers of activity for each cost pool, which is important because uh, you can measure now something directly allocated to that activity. One of the downsides of this is if you see them going down, it does get a little complicated, and that's, that's one of the, the downsides. Um, so when you're looking at this, the traditional, the cost driver rate equals the activity cost pool over the activity volume. So this, this is a rate that's given to the cost driver. And then you're able to use that rate to calculate product costs. So just like before in the absorption model, the unit of activity and the overhead rate is used to calculate cost. But here you have the product cost is this activity volume Right, so I know what I'm what I'm going to do in a period of time, or I know what I did do, times this rate. Now with time driven, the difference is you're taking out the activity and you're allocating it directly to time. And there's a beauty to this system, which I'll get into further um, with the the next slides. But the benefit to that is now you're not having to to track all these activities, you're just tracking time. Um, so standardizing that unit is very significant. Now here you have your product costs is time taken times the cost per unit of time. So you have a unit cost of time versus a cost driver rate and the time taken versus the activity volume. Um, it's like the number of parts ver with the traditional activity based on uh, versus with time driven, the amount of time. So the question is, do you want to measure a bunch of parts or do you want to measure time? Because everyone knows time. So when you look at activity-based costing as a process, the traditional is, it's quite an endeavor. Um, 
So you go through this process of identifying resource activities where the resources are put into pools, the actual costs in a frame of time is determined, you connect the resource costs with different activity allocations. So you have a bucket of money or something and you're connecting it to an activity uh, pool, a cost pool, a resource pool is what you're calling it. The next step, you're, you're coming into this activity cost allocation. You break down each activity pool into the little parts, right? You break it down into these sub-activity cost objects. To do this, though, you use surveys and there are different types of approaches. Um, all these different approaches, they take a lot of time and a lot of resources because you're going out and you're speaking to a lot of people. Maybe you can pull the data out of something if you already have it. Next, you're going into this activity cost driver. Using the driver, you're able to allocate the activity now back to the resource pool. So you're starting to branch down and connect these things together. Uh, so this is time studies and ERP and surveys. Uh, this is where you're saying how many hours per activity, right? So with this, you're getting into time, but it's not your primary unit at the end. It's just the pieces are connected to time. Um, so then we have activity driver rates. So this is where we calculate the rate. So we connect what we had earlier, which is the resource cost uh, driver to the, the actual rate. Um, and then we have these objects. So we break these down into uh, rates based on the cost objects and based on allocation. And then we report the information uh, about the resource pool allocation and you get an output. The output is basically what your product cost is. Uh, this is activity volume, like we talked about earlier, times the cost driver rate. So with time-driven activity-based costing, this process is a little simpler, a lot simpler actually, um, which we'll, we'll, I'll get into more on some subsequent slides. So the process looks like this. You determine your capacity, theoretical and practical. You break down the capacity into time in minutes. Determine the theoretical hours per day and the actual based on reality in a fixed frame of time. So we're saying, do you have eight hours a day? Whoops, sorry. Do you have eight hours a day? Really? No. Okay, you have six or whatever it is. So we're determining what that, that time is actual, uh, realistic. And then we're saying, use the cost based on the spend uh, or budget in a fixed frame of time. So what is our budget or what is our cost or what is our spend or whatever? Um, so take that total amount now we've got two pieces of information. Next step, we're determining practical capacity. So this is where we use, okay, what was our theoretical capacity? We said eight hours a day, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do a reality check with this step and we're gonna say, what is our practical capacity uh, to calculate a cost rate per minute? Per minute is important. You don't wanna do per hour um, and you'll see why. So activity driver rate, and cost pools is the next step. So you break down each activity, you determine how long each activity is budgeted based on time per activity, and then you determine if time budgeted is under or over capacity, and you make adjustments. Uh, the cool thing about both of these models, this one being more simpler, is that you can make adjustments because you can see in real time, uh, or at least a shorter frame of time, what's going on. So these reports and the output allows you to look at your product costs by time taken times cost per unit of time. Um, so just flipping back activity volume times cost driver rate versus time taken times cost per unit. So how do we determine capacity, uh, theoretical and practical? Um, simply put, a number of people uh, per business unit, number of days per quarter, theoretical hours per day, minutes per hour, and there we go. Theoretical capacity in minutes. Um, practical capacity, uh, same type deal, number of personnel, business unit, days per quarter, number of practical hours per day, minutes per hour. So you just do this equation, Excel will do it for you. It's a lot easier to use Excel, um, which I've provided a model that's attached to the slide, so hopefully everyone gets to use that. Uh, and feel free to reach out if you have questions after. Here's an example calculation I did with Excel um, using this template that I attached. So the time-driven activity-based uh, cost model to allocate indirect costs. So for this model, for this example, we have uh, 10 personnel working 
eight hours in a day, uh, number of working minutes in a day, number of work days in a period. So we did 130 days in a period here. Um, and you get your theoretical capacity. So this is what we expect we're going to get productivity wise out of our organization. We say, okay, well, we have this many hours in a day, right? The difference with this model is you, you actually look at practical capacity. So you look at non-productive work time. Like how many hours a day do we not get work done uh, with other things, you know, checking emails, doing training, doing whatever it is. Uh, so we can estimate with this model two hours per day. So we're only getting six productive hours per day. Um, and this is our practical capacity, which is significant. So when we're looking at the total cost and practical capacity and rate per minute, uh, so you're taking your total cost per budget and you divide that by your practical capacity in minutes, and that is where you get your time-driven activity-based cost rate per minute. So this is what we're saying our practical capacity cost is per minute. Uh, or what our rate is per minute normalized to practical capacity. So this is where we do the gut check and we say, are we, are we actually able to accomplish this based on our practical capacity minutes? And this is our rate. So you'll see here in this example, total costs to be allocated. Uh, and then you have your practical capacity in minutes. So this gives you your cost rate per minute rounded to three decimal places. Um, how this is calculated, uh, the, the Excel spreadsheet I attached will we'll do that for you, but basically what we're looking at now is how to use that information, right? So we say budgeted and unused capacity, budgeted costs and unused capacity. Uh, so we're going to look at the act, list all the activity types, determine the number of activities in a quarter. Remember when we talked about demand earlier, that's why it's really important to understand that. Um, and now we determine how long each activity takes in minutes. So there is some information you need to come in with this model. You do need to understand your processes, um, but it simplifies things quite a bit because you can look at things based on the 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 scope of zoom you want to use on the microscope or the telescope, depending on how, how far you want to go in or how, how close you want to look at this. So we have here activity type uh, times the number of activities per quarter, and then the number of minutes per activity. So you see here, you will need to know the number of activities that you're doing in a quarter by that activity type and how long those activities take. Uh, and this is where there's a lot of flexibility to this process. You go, okay, uh, it's not an art, it's a science, but do you use the mean? Do you use the worst case? Do you use the mean plus some factor to give you a, a little bit of an over its estimation? Um, that's flexible when you come into this. Uh, and that's where this is important, just understanding what you're doing here from a starting point and aligning on that going forward. Okay. Uh, so the bottom calculation, you see the activity type times the number of activities per quarter times the number of minutes per activity. Then you multiply time your times your cost rate um, per minute. This gives you your budgeted time-driven activity-based costs per quarter, and this is used to determine variance to plan. So above here, you've got your total uh, time in in demand in minutes uh, minus your practical time in minutes that gives you your capacity variance per quarter so you use this calculation and you're able to say what is our variance of capacity in quarter based on what we actually can achieve or did achieve and then down below you're saying what are we budgeted how much are we budgeting or under or over so this is where you're saying I have 22,000 extra minutes in a quarter that I didn't use or I have X amount of dollars in a quarter that I didn't use. Um, and that's where this model is, is really uh, effective. That's why I wanted to spend a little more time on this slide. So looking at this, this gives you that example uh, that I, or the equation I just talked about as an example. 
So we look at the budgeted cost and unused capacity. So we budgeted for a project, uh, 96,000 minutes based on everybody uh, on project work uh, at our cost rate. So you see budgeted costs over to the side. Um, so you take all of these budgeted time and minutes. This is what we think we're going to do or, or what we actually uh, budgeted for. And then we say, what did we actually achieve based on our practical capacity? Now you see we have an unused capacity of 261,600 minutes, which is about $201,000. So you say this is on a quarter or, or whatever it is, and then we say, okay, now we have underachieved based on our practical capacity. Um, we know that we can go back and, and do better uh, in the next frame of time or whatever it is, because we realize we have that gap. Um, and how you choose to use this is, is a lot of flexibility. So to implement this, um, so Kaplan's book was really helpful. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big read though, it's a couple hundred pages and it, there's a lot of detail, but you can kind of cut out what you need by just going through it and understanding it, um, which is what I did. I read the book and then went back and said, okay, what is, what is significant? What can I pull out and actually use uh, for a tool? So if you're looking at designing the system to implement, um, Kaplan provides this framework. Uh, he also provides some, some uh, recommendations for different ways to approach this if you want to do it as an event or something like that. Who do you need to get involved? What are all the key players? Uh, so you look at this in phases. You have preparation, analysis, you pilot the model, and then you roll it out. Uh, you obviously want to you know, test the water and do it on a small scale if you're going to roll this out in your organization. So preparation, you come in, you develop a plan and a team, uh, you get everything together, timeline, um, requirements, make sure you have all the data, estimate the cost. Then you do your analysis, you go get your data, you estimate the time and finalize the requirements, um, and you pilot. So this is where you come in, you use the equation, and so software or Excel or whatever it is, you import the cost data objects, you run the model, and you validate it um, based on your existing system. And then, then you roll out uh, templates, uh, wherever the gaps exist, you educate people how to use it, you gather the data, and this is where you get like a steering committee or somebody to facilitate this, and, and you start to get that reoccurring benefit, because now you have a lot more visibility potentially than you had before to understand resources and how to plan. Um, so this is a really great approach. Uh, it does take some time. I've done a couple of these um, using this model and it might take three days, five days of, of sitting down and getting through it with you, if you have everything together. So it is like a team approach to doing it and it does need some facilitation. So example uh, process summary from a time-driven activity-based cost. So you can see here, it's a great example of taking some processes with time spent in a fixed uh, time frame, comparing it with capacity and utilization um, to see how the model is effective, right? So they look at processes, the shipping fluid, consolidation, packing small parts, chemicals, or whatever. Um, so all these different uh, things, they modeled the time, the head count, the total capacity, which was practical. And then you look at your utilization. So with this view, it's, it's, it's a great view because you go, okay, where are we under capacity? Where are we over capacity? Where can we shift things around uh, to get the help we need? Um, where do we need to hire? Where do we have some resources we may need to move around? Uh, this gives you that. So it depends on the scale of what you're looking at uh, to get to what you want. So there are multiple applications of this. Uh, of both time-driven and activity-based, uh, traditional activity-based costing. So some of the ways that the book gives as examples to how you can use this are strategic or operational, right? So strategic would be profitability uh, for product or customer or supplier, facility, uh, cost to serve, uh, store stock keeping, so process and strategic benchmarking. KPIs, like a system where you're going back and getting that feedback loop. You know, how are we achieving what we want to achieve? What, what do we need to achieve? 
uh, compensation, balanced scorecard. Some of the other things I've seen this for strategic is really around price modeling. Like you come in and you can do this for a new service. You can model a new service and say, what do we need to price this at? Well, here's our price point based on blah, 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 going into the model. And it gives you a good, a good understanding of what your actual costs are. Understanding your actual costs allows you to price better. Operational um, costs. So when you model this, how do you use it operational so you can negotiate uh, with customers, uh, menu-based pricing, price per value added, uh, shareholder value reporting, order optimization, costing, internal controls, capacity analysis, right? So what's, what's what we're talking about here. And important to note in this is, if you're looking at any type of system, and I'm big on OPEX, any kind of improvement system, how do you measure improvement? How do you know where to focus your improvement? This is a good way to start. You get this information, you go out and you say, okay, I need to look at my organization and understand where the help is needed, where I need to put focus. Um, how do you understand that without really having that granularity? Uh, and this is where this model shines. Um, so there's some, some other examples I listed on here. So like I said, scoping, capacity and resource planning, uh, expansion, uh, through resource planning. Those are both time-driven activities. Uh, you may not know the exact time, but then you can estimate and understand. Somebody have a question? Okay. So I'll move on. So scoping new work uh, to determine actual cost, right? Uh, you can use activity-based costing for that or time-driven, both. Um, so focusing on lean improvement. It's a, it's a very important thing. So if you look at things like, uh, there's two references on here for uh, publications. So activity-based costing uh, and cost of poor quality. So cost of quality, it's, it's my focus for my research, for my doctorate, is, is very important. If you look at internal failure, external failure costs, all these things, how do you understand that and have a feedback mechanism? This is how you do that, okay? And it helps you make decisions. For, for lean operating? How do you come in and know where to put your attention and focus like we spoke to? Okay, so um, conventional versus time-driven activity-based costing. Uh, this is a really great uh, summary slide to give you some information when you're looking at this. So conventional, if you do a model, um, you're looking at the number of models is one, departments is one, you have five activities in that department, Time-driven is all one down the board, right? Uh, number of interviews is one. Number of interviews per year. So this is a cyclistic process. You're going back and saying, did we change our processes? Did we do this, right? For the activity in the conventional model. For time-driven, uh, it's a lot simpler. There's a lot less. You'll see that here with the facility model as well. So the facility model, uh, the number of departments is obviously going to stay the same but the number of activities is gonna be heavily driven here. So here you see 25 is the number of departments. We're saying there's 25 activities, but here there's 25 activities in each department. So this model requires you to, to understand 125 activities. Um, and then the number of interviews per year is significant, right? We're doing 300 interviews. We're going back and we're getting information to try to figure this out, put back into this conventional model for activity-based costing because it's activity-based and not time-based. So for a small enterprise, here's, a, here's an example of the number of interviews. So you see conventionally, this model is significantly more work than the time-driven. So this is a vast improvement by Kaplan to launch this out and be able to look at how to use this approach for costing in financial models uh, simply, right? So a large enterprise, you might expect one model with time-driven or a thousand models with a conventional with a vast number of departments and activity differences um, and initial interviews. So there's still going to be interviews initially to understand if you don't have data to collect it, but then there's that cyclistic aspect that you have to go back with conventional versus time-driven, right? So this is the next to the last slide, um, but here we're looking at cost benefit of time-driven activity-based costing. How do we, what is our strategic plan? What's our roadmap, right? How do we get our benefit out of this process, um, which is recommended to, to scope impact and start 
where you have a, a low implementation difficulty. So when you look at that four blocker, it's low and it's discrete, right? So we know we can do something that's gonna be easy to implement and it's gonna be focused in one area. We're gonna test it out. We're gonna see how it works. We're gonna reap the benefits of that focus area. Um, and it says, you know, contract changes. Um, so here, as you increase, you're saying, we're gonna make this enterprise wide. We're gonna change our entire operating mechanism in the scope. Um, and over here for difficulty, we're gonna say, this is gonna be extremely difficult to implement. Um, so it's recommending to go through this process from a business perspective, starting with low and discrete, um, and then going into uh, easy to implement enterprise wide, and then going into business changes. This is gonna be more of an enterprise impact and high. Um, so when you look at this process though, it's just, it's a summary of how do you implement this? So now you understand what, what it does, but where do you focus on it? So it'd be good within your organization to take this type of approach and map it out and see where you're gonna get the benefits. And that's it. So here's my references. Um, so I will open it up. Questions. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for that wonderful presentation on laboratory research planning and modeling. I think you gave us a really nice overview of the um, financial overhead allocation comparison. So, yeah, we had several questions and, and you know, you really hit home the, the, the benefit of the time-driven um, ABCs. And I want to ask, has, has a lot of industries started moving this way? Is this something very new? I mean, what, what, are, what are businesses doing in, your, in what you've seen? No, it's, it's typically something that's done through some type of external engagement or some consulting. Um, it's, it's an approach that's usually used by the big consultants. Like Bain or something like that would come in and they would use this type of approach. Um, it's not used as heavily because it is a little more complicated and it's, it's non-traditional. So because of that, it's not. It doesn't mean it's not effective. It's obviously more effective if you use it properly but it's about changing the mindset. You know, what are, what are typical, what is typical when you're learning accounting coming into an organization um, out of school is the traditional approaches, you know, P&L or something like that. You're using these things and you're saying, okay, we're gonna use that traditional approach, not an activity-based approach, which takes a lot more work and it's a model and it's a system you have to develop that has, you have to maintain. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use it within a microcosm of an organization because even if you still have an existing accounting system that's using costing this is a tool that you could use as a as a manager or as a unit leader to understand and be ahead of the curve uh, for you know talking to some people so you think about going to finance and asking for resources or going to an investor and asking for resources um, coming in with this kind of information, this kind of approach would put you significantly ahead of the curve. Um, and it'd be very hard to argue. Great, great, great. So one, one question, I think going back maybe slide 23. So, so there was a question, you know, talking about when you're um, calculating practical capacity and, you know, why were you not using PTO, like personal time off in, in that calculation? You can use that. Yeah, that, okay. that'd be one way to do this. Um, I think when you look at it and you say, okay, we're going to estimate what our practical capacity is, it would be in expected working hours uh, or weeks. So you say, uh, you know, 52 weeks in a year, maybe you're only calculating with 48 um, based on vacation planning and things like that. What is our practical capacity based on actual time at work? So you would subtract uh, vacation and uh, sick leave, things like that, right off the bat, and it would go in as the first sweep of elimination of time. Then you would use, I'm at work, I'm sitting in a chair, what is my practical capacity in a working day? That's where practical capacity differs in this model because it, it's actual time expected that you're going to get productivity. Um, so when you look at some of the big companies like Apple or whatever, and, oh, we have six hour work days or whatever these organizations are doing um, to try to change things up, um, they, they may be thinking about this. How much, what is our practical, practical capacity in a work day that we're actually getting value added 
productivity. And that's where you use this. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. So another question is, um, let's imagine a company lab with research activities along other routine activities. How can one revisit the TDABC for research projects where the time might not be necessarily constant? Right, right. Uh, that's a difficult question. I think that's where there may be outliers. It depends on what portion of, of your work uh, this absorbs or, or involves. If this, if this is 100% of your work, then you're going to have to do some some unique twisting of how you're looking at these activity work streams to be able to understand maybe simple, uh, moderate difficulty and extreme difficulty, right? You're going to have to split it out. And this is where it gets kind of abstract, like I talked about with the microscope. Um, do you want to go down into the details of getting in the weeds in the grass and saying, hey, we're going to look at every every microcosm of activities we do? Or do you want to do you want to genericize these into buckets that are applicable to maybe three bulk activities or something? Um, and then after that, and, and you could do this for each activity too. Say so if I have a new product, say say I'm doing COVID nineteen testing or something like that. You know, I, I want to understand that fully based on what I've previously done. You can use this model simply to to do that kind of analysis and just understand it better. Um, so it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, this whole uh, routine song and dance. So it's a flexible model, and understanding how you use it is about really thinking abstract how you're going to come in with all the data and the different uh, activities. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. And, and I think we have quite time for one last question. So how can I use the TV, TDABC effectively for activities like research and and methods development when there is significant technical uncertainty on how long different tasks will take. It's kind of like the duration of tasks. Right. Yeah. You need to understand that because that's that's the first aspect of this. If you don't understand how long things take, then that's where you need to go to Gamba. You need to get boots on the ground. You need to do time studies. Um, you need to do your best guess estimation of of what. This is where we talked about the the average. I have data. Uh, you don't want to do the low end. You don't want to do you. You don't want to do the extreme high end, but you definitely don't want to underestimate. So I would say lean towards a more conservative overestimation than an underestimation for sure. But you need to know that. You need to know how long your stuff takes. Okay, great, great. Well, yeah. Well, um, this brings us to the end of our um, second webinar in the uh, 2020 Alma webinar series. We'd like to remind you that this webinar will be available on the ALMA website. On behalf of ALMA, we would like to thank Jonathan Walson for presenting today. We would also like to thank the audience for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to join us today. Thanks again to Pace Analytical and ASTM International for sponsoring this webinar. For more information on our upcoming webinars, please visit the ALMA website. We look forward to you joining our next webinar on October 7th when Scott Hanton will present on the new challenges in lab management, leading and developing remotely. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.